Welcome to Chatting the Pictures. This week, we'll be exploring questions about presidential leadership in moments of public health crisis. And we'll be doing that by examining photographs made by our special guest, Pete Souza. Overall, this episode will explore what it looks like to picture a health crisis from inside the presidency. My name is Kara Finnegan, and I'm a writer, teacher, and communication scholar currently finishing a book on presidents and photography. My name is Michael Shaw. I'm a writer, a psychologist, and also publisher of Reading the Pictures. And my name is Pete Souza. I was the former chief official White House photographer for President Obama and an official White House photographer for President Reagan. Michael, why don't we start with the first of Pete's images, which comes from the Ebola crisis in 2014. This photo was taken in the Oval Office October 24th, 2014, and it shows President Obama hugging Nina Pham, a Dallas nurse diagnosed with Ebola 13 days before after caring for an infected patient in Texas. Following treatment at the National Institute of Health Clinical Center in Bethesda, Pham was now virus-free. In the doorway, you see HHS Secretary Sylvia Burwell, Pham's mother and sister are in the photograph to the left, and then off Obama's collar is Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and then you also see Dr. Ronnie Jackson of the White House Medical Unit. Just as a little bit of background, Josh Ernst, the White House press secretary, told reporters that aides never questioned whether Mr. Obama should get close to Mrs. Pham. Obama was actually quoted telling Pham, let's give a hug for the cameras. I guess the first thing I'll say is that there's three doorways into the Oval Office. This is sort of the ceremonial doorway that they have just walked in. Usually that door is always closed and there's a Secret Service agent standing outside that door every time that the President of the United States is inside the Oval Office. And so that door doesn't get used that much. It's for when heads of state come in, very ambassadors. And so she was accorded a very ceremonial entrance by coming in through that door as opposed to the back door by his personal aide's office. As soon as she walked in, President Obama gave her a hug. You know, at first, I was upset that I couldn't see her eyes in the photograph, just the way it sort of unfolded. But actually seeing the smile sort of makes it even more appropriate. Now, you mentioned about what Josh Ernest said. When I made this picture, there were not any press in the room. Press did not come in the room until they were seated during the meeting. And it was during that session where President Obama said that he should give her a hug. Well, he had already hugged her. And then he did it again when the press photographers were in the room because he knew symbolically it was important to do that again. One thing that's really important to understand today, looking back, is the political context. On that very same day, Governors Cuomo and Christie had imposed a mandatory 21-day quarantine on all air travelers returning to New York, New Jersey from West Africa who had contact with Ebola patients. Other governors did as well. There were some schools that were actually closed in Ohio. There was a patient diagnosed with Ebola in New York City that week. And then also in terms of the political environment, the right wing was very active in terms of there was a lot of accusations that he was using the Ebola to distract from problems with the rollout of Obamacare. Donald Trump at the time was tweeting that Ebola is much easier to transmit than the CDC admits. He was advocating for the closing of borders. So it's quite a lot of adversity and fear that was in the atmosphere at the same time. And I don't know that I was necessarily aware of the politics of what was taking place. I was certainly aware of the fear that was going through the country. It was hard to escape that feeling. But in terms of the politics or the criticism, it's sort of like <laughs> there was always criticism. I didn't feel that sort of affected. Because that was always in the atmosphere. Well, and I think that he was certainly aware and he was wrapping his head around trying to do the best thing so it didn't become an even bigger problem. In cases like this, I don't I didn't find that he was so concerned about the politics of what he was doing. You're trying to do the, the best thing that you can in the moment. Well back to the Josh Ernst quote, it's really interesting how this photograph works certainly on two levels. That one, it's a very personal response, an emotional response to hug her, to congratulate Nina for surviving. And then certainly there is a strategic aspect to this that's really important to show people that 
in the face of the fear and paranoia, both real and political, that there's nothing to be afraid of, that what you're seeing is a powerful act of reassurance and also modeling the fact that Ebola is transmitted through bodily contact, and that's what you have here. So he's connecting both with her and with the problem in the most personal way. Well, I think more importantly, that someone that had been declared Ebola free was okay to interact with. And I think that was an even more important signal because there was a stigma attached to anybody that had had Ebola, you know, whether other people could interact with those people once they were cured. This aspect of presidential leadership in a crisis is really nicely pictured in this photograph to the extent that part of what a president does is model behavior in public and particularly in the context of a dangerous public health crisis. As you said, it is important to make that visible to people. It is important to communicate that to the public. And the fact that that was reperformed, if you will, in front of the news cameras and those other images, I think highlights that as well. It's not something that he would normally do, which is sort of perform, if you will, in front of the press cameras. But I think he was well aware of the importance and the symbolic nature of doing that a second time. And, you know, I thought of it, there's a, a visual analogy to another of your photos that I think speaks to the same point when the president and one of his daughters swam in the Gulf after the oil spill. Again, that idea to model safety in that case, to dispel fears that the public might have had. You know, you sort of mentioned the two times probably during his presidency where he did that, where he sort of performed, if you will, to make a point. That was something that he rarely did, where he purposely did something to try to send a signal. The other thing, you know, Pete, when the first thing you mentioned about the photo was that you were sorry that we couldn't see Mina Femme's eyes initially, but then you saw the smiles. And to me, the smiles really are the entire thing that animates this photograph. It's on the faces of everybody in the background. It's coming onto the president's face. It's obviously a joyous and exciting moment for her and her family to meet the president in the context of her returning to health. But I also see, I think on the faces of everybody, and perhaps Fauci, if we can see his face too, that there's a relief playing out, right? That at least at this moment, the crisis, at least for this person, has abated. It's just a really joyous photograph. There's a number of pictures of Fauci meeting with Nina a few minutes before or walking her over from another building, greeting her for the first time. And he is so effusive. And the pictures show that. The other thing I think this photograph does, especially in the context that we are in right now, is it highlights the threats faced by healthcare workers. This was a nurse who was infected. And to the extent that we're spending a lot of time right now fearing for the safety of healthcare workers, it's really hard not to read that anxiety and fear and then also feel good about the relief um, when you look at this particular photograph. And it's unavoidable to draw a contrast between what's happening now with coronavirus and also the presidential leadership. We already mentioned, and it's very obvious, this kind of emotional, personal, intimate contrast. But then there's other things going on in this photograph, structurally, if you will, that speak to that also. You have this, literally, this kind of alignment or coherence. You've got Pham and Obama hugging, but Fauci, to the extent that he's merged into this, he's part of the hug. You think about roles and you think about the coherence of the roles. Pham is both in this photograph a patient and a medical worker, you know, one of those people that are on the front line right now. So you have the leader embracing the patient medical worker. And then you have the scientist representing that whole community. And then also Dr. Jackson there, who's a physician in the White House. So the way that you have that kind of coherence and alignment has a powerful message when you compare it to what's going on right now and how all those different components are kind of, you know, what, every man and woman for themselves? You know, the one political aspect of this photograph that in context you have to take into consideration is Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who was President Obama's physician and stayed on, carried over to the Trump administration, and was so highly thought of that Trump nominated him to be the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. And then there was a whole controversy where he had to pull himself out of the running. He left the White House moved back to Texas, and is now running for Congress. 
And in March, echoed what Trump's comments were about the coronavirus, that it was a hoax, that it wasn't going to amount to anything, that it wasn't going to become a pandemic, which is pretty interesting in, in retrospect. The other thing sort of like off topic a little bit is, is I look at this image and it's on the fly. I've used too slow a shutter speed for the moment, and you can sort of see the blur of his hands, which indicates that. And it's tilted, which I don't tilt pictures, but it was kind of a very much a grab shot. And yet I was still sort of always aware of my foreground and background. So I was really trying to keep one of the paintings in the picture, which is you sort of see the Washington painting in the background. Why don't we move on? Here's our next image. This photograph shows President Obama touring the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland on December 2nd, 2014. He's with Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. In the photo, the two men listen to Nancy Sullivan, a senior researcher on Ebola at NIH's Vaccine Research Center. The researchers there were working on a trial for an Ebola vaccine. The visit was part of a push to get Congress to approve over $6 billion to help fight the Ebola outbreak, including $1.5 billion in contingency funds for general pandemic response. So he went on this tour, as you mentioned, at the Vaccine Research Center. You know, one of the advantages that I have as White House photographer is I can pretty much go anywhere. Um, so rather than be on the same side of the counter, if you will, as him, I went on the backside where you could sort of see through almost like a cubby hole. I was intrigued by some of the screens that were facing me trying to get those in the foreground. This is actually not the original picture that we made public on Flickr. The one that we made public, you could better see Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Fauci was further in the background and you couldn't really make him out that well. But I mean, I was working like sort of on the other side, trying to incorporate some of the screens and graphics and things like that, just to make an interesting picture. Pete, did you see that photograph that Doug Mills took for the New York Times of Fauci and President Trump uh, looking at a coronavirus model on a tour of NIH in March? I did not. It's a really crazy photograph because you have Trump looking at the model. There's a researcher in the foreground. Fauci is behind Trump. So it's really like much more kind of a hierarchical photograph. One thing that's great about your picture is not just how engrossed they are and how they're on that kind of same plane, as you said, but also just like you've got the wires that you really feel like you're in a laboratory here. He's plugged into the science in a way. He was fascinated by science and technology, and he had this group that he met with. It would be like an hour and a half, and the agenda would be totally up to the two scientists that led the session. Sometimes he would walk in and not even necessarily know what the topic of the day was going to be. He was fascinated by those, those meetings, and they always went long. The other thing about this image that I really like in terms of the way you composed it, Pete, is you've got, as you said, this really interesting foreground of dials and things to plug in and screens and clearly laboratory materials all around. And then you've got Obama listening to scientists. And I've always noticed it's a visual theme in your photos of Obama listening, right? That presidents spend a lot of time in meetings and ideally they're listening as much or perhaps more than they're talking. And this is, it's a great image of Obama listening to scientists and taking them seriously and paying attention, where clearly this is the domain of the scientists. It is not the Oval Office or some other context. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, it's interesting that you say that. I've seen some of these press conferences where the scientists, whether it's Fauci or Dr. Burks, are up at the podium talking, and you see Trump in the background. And his eyes are just looking everywhere except to where the people are speaking. It's as if he's not really paying attention to what they're saying. And I always thought that when Obama listened, he really listened. Like he was laser focused on what was being said to him. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because this photograph stresses data. It stresses information. There's one's a screen and the other it looks like a magazine spread that shows the problem literally at the cellular level. And the way they're listening and the way, I guess, Obama was oriented 
It's about that depth. So to see a photograph now where they're really in the working space, the lab's not a background, it's more the subject, and one where there's the kind of the metaphor of literally like seeing through is incredibly reassuring, especially in light of how superficial the science is as it's being presented to us in the current crisis. Do you also get a sense historically of the longevity of Anthony Fauci, right? So that the fact that he, as a member of the current cast of coronavirus characters, that he extends back, certainly further back than Obama even, highlights that, you know, expertise endures in contexts where perhaps leadership changes more regularly. And that's another thing I think in this context that makes this photo really striking to me. And from another dimension in terms of Fauci, speaks also to how much he's been clashing and there's been this kind of merger and then tension between him and Trump, is that in this photograph, you both see Fauci and Obama feeling like equals on one level, but then also because of the way they're divided there, you also see them clearly in their respective lanes. And that also is very reassuring to me right now. Well, there's also one little detail that's really interesting. I actually just blew it up to see if I could tell exactly what it is. But there's a photograph on the right side of the frame above the screen, which I think is their team. At least that's what it looks like to me. Absolutely. To be reminded that we're of the team spirit and that you don't get anywhere without the team is also great. And the fact that it balances the other side of the photograph from the leaders and your top guy, Dr. Fauci, is also eloquent. Okay, here's our next photo. This photograph was taken October 10th, 2011. And it's not about a virus or a pandemic, but it is about health and leadership and how a president performs when life and limb is on the line. We see President Obama at Walter Reed Hospital wearing protective gear before a meeting presenting the Purple Heart to a soldier who was severely injured in Afghanistan. Pete, can you take us back and tell us a little bit about the context here? And also, if you know how Obama came to don the hospital guard. Every four months, he would go to Walter Reed to visit wounded warriors. We went 24 times in, in the eight years. I went on every one of those visits. We would take the helicopter from the South Lawn and helicopter directly to the landing zone at, in Bethesda. This was a visit where he presented several Purple Hearts, as I recall, in instances where they were worried about a patient getting an infection, he would have to put on the gown and the gloves, as would I. And so this is right after he's put on his gloves and covering and he's walking into the room. One of the interesting things to me was that we didn't release photographs from these visits of him with patients. I think we only did it a couple of times for specific stories, like we did one when the New York Times was doing a story. But of course, the press office was always coming to me after the visit saying, did you get anything that we can post publicly? And I would usually say no. This was one instance where I just thought this was such an interesting photograph, and it doesn't show who the patient is, but it really gives you an idea of what it was like to be there. One of the things I think is really interesting about this photograph is it's actually not a picture about the president at all. It's a picture about the soldier and the sacrifice. So the fact that the Purple Heart is so ceremonially waiting for its recipient, the fact that that's what's in focus, the fact that it's being held by another service member, that to me is a really compelling element of this photograph, that the president is a kind of conduit, if you will, a very important conduit, but nevertheless, as Pete said, what's really being pictured here is the recognition and the honor tied to somebody's sacrifice. It's interesting the way when it came time to present the Purple Heart, it's a very ceremonial presentation. The president's military aide, when it involved the Purple Heart, would also come into the room and read the formal citation, and everybody would stand at attention, and then the president would pin the Purple Heart if family were visiting, if they were in the room, and you see what looks like the guy's dad standing over the bed waiting for the president to walk in, they would also stand at attention while the ceremony took place. Well, I also like Obama in the garb. It gives you the feeling of the president 
as not just commander in chief, which the foreground emphasizes, but as he moves toward the patient and the patient's room, you get more of the feeling almost literally of Obama as an aid worker, as someone there to heal, as someone there to comfort. The fact that he can be between the two roles, literally, is something that's really wonderful about this picture. When you walk into the room, the president doesn't know, is this guy a Republican or is he a Democrat? Did he vote for me or did he vote for John McCain? It didn't matter. It doesn't matter when the president of the United States, it shouldn't matter. When the president of the United States walks in to pay his respects to somebody who put his life on the line to fight for our country. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. For the most part, that's the way people looked at him. This was the president of the United States. And I think that there was a certain amount of mutual respect there. He's also a human being. So you walk into that room. Yes, you're the president of the United States. You're representing the country. You're also one person. You're one man trying to have a connection with this person that put their life on the line. Pete, your comment about how sometimes the president would be asked to garb up in the gown and you know, or the gloves, as we see here, really strikes me because in that sense, this is also an image of a president who's, again, following the advice of experts and following rules for the safety of others. So that in this image, you have, although the personal protective equipment that we're all used to talking about and seeing right now does not seem to be sufficiently covering the president. Nevertheless, you have in this image, somebody who is saying, yes, I will dress this way because that will help make this person I'm about to meet and honor safer. And I think that's an interesting point. And again, something that in any other context, you know, wouldn't strike us as much as I think it does in this moment that we're all in right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that the more important thing is that he was wearing the gloves, right? That he wasn't going to pass on any germs to the patient. I think that was the, the most important thing, because if he wanted to shake his hand, he still could. Whereas if he wasn't wearing his gloves, he probably couldn't. It's funny looking back at this picture because I could sort of see like what happened just before this it would be there'd be three guys or women standing outside the room, each of them with a gown and a pair of gloves. So there'd be somebody for me, somebody for the president, somebody for the Secret Service. And of course, I would always try to run up ahead. One thing that's worth mentioning also in comparison to photographs we're seeing from the White House these days is how this photograph is more poetic. It's more symbolic. It leaves more to your imagination and it respects the viewer that way. You can imagine Obama in that room and how that goes, whereas what you'd see today would be a kind of grip and grin situation, a very posed photograph, everyone smiling for the camera, maybe with the thumbs up. I just think that this has more poetry and pays more respect to the viewer as well. Let's move on to our final image, which is actually a contact sheet. This contact sheet is from President Reagan's visit to the National Institute of Health during the AIDS epidemic on July 23rd, 1987. If we go back to the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, clearly one of the criticisms of President Reagan was that he was slow to respond to this crisis. This was a young child that was infected with the HIV virus. There was a lot of bad information out there on how this virus would be transmitted. One of the things that this picture did, the one that circled, that was the picture that we made public. And I think it went a long ways into showing people that this virus was not transmitted by touching another person. I think the photo that circulated, I can see it on the NIH site, the middle one on the bottom row. But it's flipped. Yes. The one that they circulated was flipped and it's cropped also. It's odd. If you go back to those days in the 80s, if we were going to make a picture public, we had a, a secure Navy lab, photo lab, that would process the film and make prints. And so we would make five, eight by 10 prints and we would hand them off to like the wire services. That's where the word handout comes from. And it's possible that we had cropped this to a vertical, but how that got flipped onto the NIH website, I don't really know how that could have happened. People read left to right usually in these photographs. And when you see it also cropped, so you don't see all those people in the window, you see this line that moves from like lower left, more like to upper middle. And it just seems more comfortable to look at it that way. Something does seem to work better compositionally when it's flipped. But that's not a reason to do it. 
to me, that's being untruthful to flip up a photo. You know, I think there was a time in maybe the 50s and 60s where newspapers would do that routinely, starting at least in the 70s, which is when I started my career. That was something that we would never do. You're changing the accuracy or the truthfulness of a photograph to flip it, to fit a composition or a layout. It's so obvious when I look at it on the NAH site because Reagan had a part in his ear and it was on the wrong side. And I knew yeah. right away. Especially a public figure that you're used to seeing all the time, something would appear a little off, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. This was a long time ago. This was 33 years ago. So it's hard to remember, you know, the details of this particular situation. I don't have any recollection of how this all transpired other than, you know, I was there to document it. But I do know that once I made this picture, the White House, I can't remember if it was Larry Speaks or whoever was the press secretary at the time. It may have been Marlon Fitzwater came to me and said something like, you know, we need to release that photograph. It's not that they would have seen the photograph before they said that. This was film. And it was probably not till, you know, they probably didn't see the proof sheet till three hours later, four hours later. But they were probably in the room somewhere meeting somebody from the press office and said, you know, we need to release this photo. The first time I believe that Reagan mentioned AIDS in a speech was in May of 87. So just a few months before this, that interest in featuring this photograph of a very spontaneous human moment in the context of a president who is kind of newly going public on AIDS and belatedly, as many people felt, you know, that makes a lot of sense just from the perspective of the White House. And I always found that the Reagan administration, to some extent, had image too much in mind. When the space shuttle Challenger exploded, I happened to have this picture of him, Reagan, and his aides watching. They weren't watching it live. They watched a televised replay moments after it exploded. And I had this picture that was very solemn. And you see the corner of the TV in the foreground, and you see Reagan and the aides in the background. The photo office wanted to make that picture public because they thought this is an authentic image of a historical moment. And I remember the White House, including the then chief of staff, was adamantly opposed to showing Reagan in like a real moment, which is sort of kind of amusing to me. We are thrilled to have had Pete Souza with us today. His work was not only brilliant over several administrations, but his pictures tell stories and communicate an intimacy that we just aren't seeing anymore. Thanks, Michael and Kara, for having me on Chatting the Pictures. I encourage all my followers to pay attention and watch and listen and to follow reading the pictures. Michael and Kara provide an interesting analysis and context for social and political images today. Sometimes they bring up aspects of a photograph that I've not even thought about, sometimes even my own photographs. And I often find myself looking at photographs a different way because of them and because of what they do. So I think it's an extremely valuable service that they're providing on imagery that's taking place in the news.